everybody. Hey, how's it going? Happy Saturday. How is everyone doing? How has your weekend been going so far? Hopefully well. Uh, we know we've had a pretty crazy week ourselves going on here. Uh, you know, between awesome, fun, exciting game streams to, uh, you know, just so many topics in the news to talk about right now. And of course, there's so much news that, well, unfortunately, a lot of the important stuff gets pushed down to the bottom of the barrel a lot of times. You know, we hear so much about, oh, well, you know, do you know who's dating who? And did you know that the iPhone is coming out with another iPhone? Well, yeah, of course, they do that every year. That happens. Tell us something that's actually important, important, you know, something that we should actually be discussing. Well, this is why we are here, or at least that's our goal, right? We try to bring you up-to-date information based on all parts of the spectrum, ranging from education, sciences, arts, and entertainment, everything that we can, we bring to you and we discuss it because that's really what it is, right? You don't need someone just reporting to you and telling you, hey, this is how things are supposed to be or these are how things are going, but let's discuss them. Let, let us help you by filtering out some of the information, shining the light on the stuff that matters, and then let's discuss and figure out, well, what the heck do we do with this information? Why is this so important and where do we go with it? You know, and there are a lot of times with these discussions too, where it's not black and white. You know, there are a lot of gray areas because there are a lot of unknowns. There are a lot of things that unfortunately we have no control over right now. We just have to see how things play out. By having these discussions now is what matters. It's about knowing where we're going, where we could go, so that way we're better prepared for when something does happen. And I don't mean to say that in the sense of like doomsday or anything like that, but even in the positive, right? Like, oh, this could lead to really good outcomes. Let's support this. Let's continue to push, you know, research into this scientific development or, um, you know, hey, there's this great charity or cause that's really fighting for, you know, human rights. Let's support that then. Let's see what we can do for them because of these articles here that we talk about every single week. Preach. <laughs> and uh, thank you, everyone, who's who's going through chat here and who has already been talking like crazy here. It's been awesome to see the activity in chat today. Thank you so very much. Uh, Denise Degrees, Trunk1791, Crazy Doc 8 uh, We got RX Mongo in the house. Thank you very much for joining us, of course, as always. Welcome, welcome, folks. And for all of those who are lurking in the background, too, listening, thank you very much. Or those that are listening via podcast, whether on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher FM, and so many other awesome podcast aggregators, thank you as well specifically for listening and for hanging out with us. We appreciate your time and your energy with these discussions. And we've got some really fun topics for you guys today and by fun i mean uh meaty discussions meaty discussion topics we're going to be talking about facebook using ai to predict your future actions we're also going to i knew you were going to say that though because i used facebook actually about an hour ago <laughs> you oh they're like man. oh yeah she's totally going to be talking about this <laughs> well they're going to be talking about us we better just like be on our best behavior Facebook, you've been naughty. That's all we're going to say. That's all we're going to say. Um, we're also going to talk about uh, all of the art that was actually hidden from the Nazis and its impact. We're also going to talk about how social media can create the news. We're going to be talking about one specific uh, event in particular, and that is the uh, Philadelphia Starbucks story. And last but not least, we are going to talk about Plastic recycling through enzymes. Yeah, there is something out there that could help us with our big plastic problem. Uh, and yes, we do actually have a plastic problem. I know many of you are probably surprised at that, but we do. And we'll talk more about that and how some scientists are going to try to solve said issue. And uh, in case you're not familiar, and that was something that I, that I was not uh, earlier, we're going to be specifically talking about also uh, the uh, different garbage patches uh, that exist around the world, and one particular one, uh, close and dear, uh, or near to uh, where we live, uh, right here in the Pacific, uh, Pacific Garbage Patch. So we'll talk about that. Oh, and that, that sounds lovely. Yeah. You think there's like an Airbnb there, like someone just built a house out of all the plastic <laughs> and you can stay there at, at night? Um, basically, you can. Yeah, you could, uh, I think at one point you could actually walk on top of it 
Ooh. See, maybe. See, maybe this is the plan. <laughs> you know, we, we talked about um, what are these these people that are homesteading or whatever. They want to, like, create yes. their own island countries and stuff and just live off of them. Yes, they so do. So maybe then if, if these people all this money want their own islands, well, there you go, folks. See? And it's recycling. Yeah. Because you're renew, reusing. Come on, folks. See, if you want a right. homestead, at least do it right. You know, take the trash with you. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. And that's that's the ultimate recycling. You're right. That's right. That's right. And uh, Garbage Patch, by the way, we're not talking about the dolls. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Don't get too excited. We're not talking about toys here. It's not a toy <laughs> story. And hey, Mario Man Z28, how you doing, bud? Good to see you, of course, as always. Dalamaz, how's it going, man? Good to see you as well. Someone actually did build a floating island out of bottles and sand. See? It can be done. Homesteaders, get at it. Let's do this. <laughs> Well, so, you know, we're talking about the future here. We're talking about, of course, a lot of times we talk about technology. Uh, you know, it is like the hottest thing since the 90s. And it just keeps on growing and growing, expanding and expanding. Uh, but with this, we also have to look at some misuses, potentially, of said technology. Uh, in this latest article from The Intercept, which, by the way, uh, the Intercept is probably, I will say, one of my favorite places for news. Uh, if you've never heard of them, go to theintercept.com. They are a nonprofit organization. They do amazing journalism, and I can't say enough good things about this group, so make sure to check them out as well. But this is from The Intercept. Uh, what they've said is Facebook uses artificial intelligence to predict your future actions for advertisers, says Confidential Document. Now. They have been in some hot water recently, they meaning Facebook, uh, since the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Mm -hmm. And we'll get a little bit more into specifics of that. But basically now, Facebook is trying to take a moral stance, hence the reason why Mark Zuckerberg met with Congress and was grilled viciously for several hours in front of cameras about the safety of the user data. And uh, Zuckerberg was quoted, by the way, when he was at Capitol Hill, he says, across the board, we have a responsibility to not just build tools, but to make sure those tools are used for good. Mm. But as nice as that all sounds, um, Facebook attempts to separate themselves, yet a confidential document has come to light to show that they actually probably have more in common with Cambridge Analytica than they'd like you to believe. So. Uh, currently, the recent document described as confidential, as The Intercept puts it, outlines a new advertising service that expands how the social network sells corporations access to its users and their lives. Instead of merely offering advertisers the ability to target people based on demographics being like where you live, uh, the type of things you buy, uh, or even like your age and gender, um, so, of course, like consumer preferences as well. Do you like going to, let's say, TJ Maxx over Target? Do you like going to Sears over, uh, you know, Kohl's, let's say? Well, no, instead, Facebook offers the ability to target them based on how they will behave and what they will buy and what they will think. Sounds pretty crazy, right? And you think, well, how can a system do this? Well, it's actually in place right now. Uh, this is capable due to their self-improving AI prediction engine, which was unveiled actually in 2016 called FB Learner Flow. So FB Facebook Learner Flow. <laughs> the document explains how it can go uh, through 2 billion, billion with a B, 2 billion users and produce millions, millions with an M, might as well be consistent, <laughs> right? Uh, and produce millions of people who are tempted to jump ship from a brand to a competitor. So what they're saying is that they have all this information that they can predict. If, say, for instance, I bought Nike shoes and all of a sudden, based on my posts and based on other pages I've liked, all of a sudden that prediction engine can go, hey, you know, this guy is starting to really, really like Reebok all of a sudden. You know, we better let Nike know, give them this information, so that way they can then target me with ads even harder to try to keep my business, thus actually changing uh, the way I think. They're trying to manipulate it based off current interactions I've had on Facebook. Now, um, how is this similar to Cambridge Analytica? Again, I said we'd mention this. I, and the thing is, is that Cambridge Analytica used their um, controversial 
psychographic profiling of voters, which uses consumer demographics to predict political action. So basically it said, hey, if you bought certain items, if you like certain pages, then that means that you're probably going to vote Democrat or vote independent or vote Republican or Libertarian or Green Party. And with that, you know, other competitive parties can then target you to try to get you to, to try to sway your decision making or even to not even show up to vote. <laughs> uh, but unlike Cambridge Analytica, the difference here is that Facebook is sitting on the mother load of information with unfettered access to a multitude, literally a multitude of staggering databases of behavior and preferences because we've all been willing to do that, right? Because what they, what Facebook has sold it to us as is that, hey, show your friends what you like. Show other people who might have commonality with you what you like and dislike, and maybe then you can connect socially, right? Well, no, they take all this information and then they provide it to these engines and to these advertisers. So now Facebook states that the consumers attached to the data um, do keep their anonymity. So they are anonymous, but this is still intimate insights that are still available and it does impact you because it'll impact you through ads. So even though your name isn't attached to where you shop online or you know what page you've liked on Facebook specifically, because of that, it does impact your overall engagement online, especially when you're on the Facebook platform. Uh, and Facebook really is because of this, not a social platform, but really just a data wholesaler. Uh, they, they really just take all this information and give it to the highest bidder. And, th and that's really the whole point of it. We actually uh, do advertising for many different companies or have in the past. And it is all about the bid. And, it, and that's actually what they call it is bidding. When you're an advertiser, you go, well, how much do you want to bid per ad to be shown? And you say, well, I'll bid 50 cents per click. I will bid 60 cents per click. And whoever has the highest bid, their ad gets shown the most because it makes Facebook the most money. So again, we all see connections here looking from the consumer perspective as well as the advertiser perspective. Uh, now the documents don't mention specifics of what is included or excluded from the prediction engine, but what could be available, and this is the important thing because this is the what ifs, and usually I say, well, there could be a lot of what ifs, but what do we have right now? But the thing is, is because Facebook has so, been so secretive about what is actually being provided to this engine, we can only work off of the what ifs. We have to, we don't, we're not really given a choice at this point. So basically what could be available would be your location, device information, Wi-Fi network details, video usage, details of friendships. So think about that one, the details of friendships, similarity between users and their friends, so not only are they utilizing your information to get to you, they could be use, utilizing your information to get to your friends and family and other network connections as well. So I guess what they're really saying is just be super friendly to the people you hate on Facebook. <laughs> that way they get all the spam. Oh, I like that. I like that. See? It's you a got silver lining thinking, there. Thinking. Yeah. Uh, but many experts are saying that there are many ethical issues that could manipulate users, such as influence elections or strong arm businesses. So now we're looking at this situation where, well, who has the most money? Great, you get all the advertising revenue, you get all the information, you can pretty much demolish this other company now through your advertising on Facebook and on some of their other platforms. Because this is the thing too, when you run ads through Facebook, it doesn't just run on Facebook. It runs on Instagram, which is owned by Facebook, or at least that's an option you have. But also there are partner sites. So as an advertiser, I can go in and say, okay, uh, Facebook check. I want it to go up on Instagram as well, check. But also I want this information and these ads to go up on some of our partner sites or some of the Facebook partner sites. So your ads can actually go up on legitimate websites all over the net as well. So this is the reach that it has. So we're not just talking about Facebook. So you could say, oh, I don't use Facebook. That doesn't mean you're safe from it though. No. You still can get hit. Um, and also, if you're not sure on the actual power of Facebook, besides all of that, of like how many kind of tentacles they have out in the web for their advertising, uh, get this. One of their success stories that they share with other businesses on why to use their advertising platform is with the Scottish National Party 
as they described um, that party utilizing Facebook advertising and their predictive engine to trigger a landslide for the party. Yes, that's impressive, but that's also damn scary. Really, really scary. Because what you're saying there is that you can manipulate people on their voting preferences, on how their country runs because of your data and because of psychology. Okay. Uh, also, uh, Jonathan Albright, researcher director at Columbia University's, uh, I believe, Toe Center for Digital Journalism, uh, said this AI targeting can always be weaponized. For example, they can be dissuaded into not voting for something. Uh, so yeah, again, you're looking at weaponization basically, and I like that term. It's a strong term, but it's pretty fair depending on what can be done with this information. Right, well, whoever controls the flow of information and what that and the content of information has a lot of power, right? Yes, absolutely right. And knows how to manipulate you, right? They, they, it's like basically getting all the secrets of the enemy, right? You're going to manipulate them because you know where their weaknesses are, where their strong points are. You're not going to face them where they're strong. You're going to face them where they're weak. And for humans, that's emotions, right? So it's emotional marketing. So they use psychology. They use emotional marketing based off all this data. And it can be really, really dangerous. Um, and even though it's up in the air to the specifics of what's being used, again, Facebook has not helped the situation because, as mentioned before, they've avoided repeated questions. They've been asked directly and have avoided it. What kinds of user data is being used? Uh, they are also reluctant to disclose how they are monetizing the AI. So they're refusing to say how they make money from the AI system. I mean, Seems that's a little sketchy. No, not at all. What are you talking about? Actually, I saw that interview with, um, I saw parts of the interview, or I guess the questioning <laughs> uh, that Zuckerberg uh, was, was put through there. And uh, I, I believe they actually asked him point blank, you know, so, you know, how does a site that has, uh, you know, gives its services for free to all the users, you know, how do you make money? And, you know, he takes a beat and he's like, well, ads. <laughs> But then to not disclose how that works, like I get it from the standpoint of, well, it's, you know, confidential business, uh, proprietary intellectual information, all this other stuff. But at the same time, the government is, is you know, bringing this up to you and for you to not be forthcoming with that seems like you've got something to hide, mm -hmm. something bad to hide. <laughs> Yeah, it, again, it's just monetization. Like, there isn't, like, a secret sauce to it. So you should be able to just say, oh, yeah, we do this. Like, because other companies have AI and use other AI systems. This isn't, like, in that way, it's not anything new. But then it's how they're utilizing it that's maybe semi-new because it's really shady. <laughs> and they're getting a spotlight put onto it, too, which is also is great in one way, but in another way... It's scary because we are learning a lot of things that we really didn't think about. And, you know, we've talked about on this show too the fact that technology can be great, but it is a tool and it depends on how people utilize it as well as how it's regulated. And right now, things like AI, for instance, or IoT items have, you know, hit the market and just blown up. And, you know, every big company, you know, wants something to do with AI, wants something to do with IoT. But there are no real safeguards. And so we mentioned things like hacking, which is a huge issue. And, you know, these basic DDoS attacks on websites now being util uh, happening through IoT devices, too, because there, there isn't really the protection there. So we don't have the regulations. We really don't have the protection because, of course, there's not a lot of money in it. Right. You know, we will. We don't want to have to safeguard these. I mean, that's, you know, the less safeguards, less issues we come across. Right. We don't have to work with. Um, these people to you know not get our systems hacked whatever you know it's we save money less obstacles in our way make it easy boom done so i mean we're, we're coming across this with with ai as well and how people are utilizing ai there's no real regulations this whole concept of data for many of the people in congress are like eh, what what is that data i don't really get it so wait so like <laughs> if i buy from star trek i don't know yeah it's like if i if i buy underwear on amazon does that mean you know what i <laughs> what what's going on like what i'm buying like oh my god and like amazon actually makes it obvious too i mean i'll be honest like you buy something off of amazon you go back on amazon it'll say hey here are five other things you might like because you purchased this thing five weeks ago 
And you'll get an email too. Like they'll send you an email, be like, hey, here are some things you might find interesting. Well, that's because they're using their your data. Right. And, and again, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but just realize that it's there, like it's happening. <laughs> Right, and it's, uh, you know, there's some really great and amazing points made in chat, um, and Crazy Doc says something that, you know, that I struggle with myself. You know, the, the more that I hear about it, the more I consider just shutting my page down. On the other hand, I have found it handy to communicate with family members that I don't get to see very often, uh, and so on and so forth, right? So I think that, uh, you know, for me as well, you know, Facebook offers all of these conveniences, all of these um, perceived benefits, right, uh, that make your life a little easier. I mean, you could certainly communicate with family members that you wanted to uh, by having to uh, do a few more extra steps, right, like actually calling them, hunting down their number, hunting down their address, figuring out a time when they're uh, available to talk, that kind of thing, right? Like, you can still obviously communicate with your family members. You can keep in touch with what's happening uh, uh, with, with news, if you could even say that what's, uh, what's posted on Facebook is news uh, at any point in time. Um, but it just it, it just makes it easier, right? And if you log in to different sites, you can log in with your Facebook account. Perfect. I don't have to remember another password or try to come up with a username or something like that, right? So there's there's all of these conveniences that Facebook offers to you. So yes. you don't even think about all of the bad necessarily because you're like, oh, but it just it makes my life better. But at the same time, you know, in, in the background, we're sort of losing some of our certainly our privacy. Uh, but also uh, some of our freedoms, I would imagine, you know, because now uh, when I want to log into that app, I'm stuck with that freaking Facebook account linked to it, you know, so I can't, I can't use that app or I can't use that service without like unlinking myself and like removing the tentacles. And then they're like, well, all your data is going to be like deleted now that you're, you know, signing in differently. So it's, it's shackling us a little bit to Facebook as well. Like they're doing mm -hmm. a good job of that as well. Well, and, and to go off that too, you know, you mentioned the convenience factor of being able to log in and they have the little button that says, oh, you could just log in with Facebook. <laughs> oh, it's, oh, it's just, that simple. It's just this button, right? Just click it. Yeah. No well, biggie. I've seen many companies where I went to sign up for something and they literally did not show me an option for email. They just said, oh, yes. do you want to sign in with Twitter or with Facebook? And yeah. I went, neither, what? motherfucker. I want to sign <laughs> with my email. Excuse my language. <laughs> but it, it was so annoying. And I had to actually dig through the site to find out where I could find a page to actually be able to sign up with email. But at that point, I was so disgusted. I'm like, I don't even know if I really want to sign up for anything here. Like, it, it, cause it's scary too. Cause then you've got to wonder why are they pushing it so much? Oh, because they're getting a ton of free information from me and how they can then advertise. And again, it's not free for them per se, right? They're paying Facebook, blah, 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 blah. But overall though, then I'm willingly just mindlessly jumping around, scanning the internet for stuff. And they're getting all that information because they're connected to my Facebook. They're connected to everything else. They know now, you know, what I like, what I don't like, and they know how to advertise to me, which from a business standpoint is like, you know, they, that's all they really want, right? Is that push to really understand their customer, ideally in a perfect world. They just want to understand their customer so they can get them what they need. But it really comes down to, well, even if you don't need it, we still want to sell it to you. We still want to make more money. How can we make more money? We've got to boost up the CEO's earnings anyway, so. You know, I wonder, and I haven't seen the movie, and I don't know if the movie explains anything, but there's a movie made, right, by, like, the the inception of Facebook, if you will, right? Uh, I haven't seen that movie. It's, I think it was called Social Network. Oh, about the creation of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was the film, yep. Have you seen it at all? I have. You know what's funny? Oh, okay. I went to it because a friend had recommended it. Say, hey, you should go see the Social Network. And I had no idea what the hell it was about. And so I went there not knowing what the hell it was about. And it starts with this bar scene and this awkward moment with the guy playing Zuckerberg. I had no idea, to be honest with you, what I was watching. And then it took like probably, what, 30 minutes into the film or 15 minutes where uh, basically his date doesn't work out. And he starts building the initial Facebook um, to because he posts uh, the information of the woman around or something to try to shame her or something like that or some like really That's sleazy how thing it started <laughs> yeah pretty much it was a revenge <laughs> thing and then it built up so I didn't realize until I got to that point I was like oh okay all right so yes I to, to shorten the answer yes I have seen it <laughs> but I figured I, I'd share that little that little moment oh that explains that, that speaking of memes there's a, we're, we're talking about bad memes in chat now that that get posted on Facebook I did see one recently with uh, you know Zuckerberg and it said something at the top like I just wanted a um, a way to 
rape girls' pretty faces, yes. and now I've <laughs> made this monster or something like that. It's it's much more eloquent on the meme, but I I was going to ask, you know, I don't think, you know, what was his initial thought process when he did make, you know, when he had the concept for Facebook, and now we know uh, that he was just a, a little boy who couldn't deal with his emotions. That's cool. But I wonder, you know, what, how did it turn into, like, from that into this? You know, like, it'd be interesting to see um, the thought process behind all that because, you know, we, we, there is, there are things in the world, right, that started out um, sort of benign, you know, and years later it just built into this monster that even the people who were running it for a while didn't necessarily recognize it for that monster until it was too late, right? Right. And I feel like that's kind of what happened with Facebook. Like, I remember when it first came out and my college wasn't on there. Like, I couldn't sign up because I wasn't uh, from, like, Harvard and MIT or something. Like, there were, like, only two course, like, two universities or something. Like, you, you needed a, an email address from that university mm. to sign up yep. to even be part of Facebook, right? And my college wasn't on it. And we all, like, felt so bad. Well, I didn't when I say we, uh, but the rest of my friends, they were like, oh, you know, they, you guys, have you heard about Facebook? Like, I want to sign up. I might, um, we need to, you know, like somehow fake an email address. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, why, why would you want to join a platform that, uh, I guess that is so exclusive and for what, you don't even really know what it is, um, but they wanted to join it. They like were like so eager for it. And now, Everybody wants to and get off of it. <laughs> it. It's really, I mean, it's so bad that even Elon Musk took Tesla, SpaceX, and many of his other Facebook pages down. Yes, Playboy also, because presumably yes. they don't want um, that data to go anywhere. <laughs> Which is kind of ironic. They show everything else, but yet. <laughs> there's, there's some, you know, there's, we draw the line somewhere, you know what I mean? And data privacy is it. There you go. I guess they don't want, you know, well, there is also that concern, too, because of what Playboy uh, is associated with, that if, you, let's say, you are a, a member, I don't know what that would be, a Playboy member, I guess? I don't know. Um, but you have, like, a subscription or something with them. You know, there could be concerns, too, of, like, well, I don't want that information being out there in the open. So especially for those, let's say, like, in the adult industry or these kind of, um, you know, like sensitive subjects taboo kind of areas <laughs> yeah like sensitive su like you know yes yeah, of course our you know those users will not feel comfortable knowing this kind of information which is fair too so it's like at the same time not only is it a, you know you have to wonder then too how much of it is moral how much of it is business but at least they're doing it i guess right that's that's at least something um and actually yeah we got great conversations in chat too uh, you know, many folks saying they don't even use Facebook or that they barely use it nowadays or they just use it to, to update a page that they help maintain, uh, that they hate it because it's full of bad memes and just annoyances and all the all the ads and so forth that are on Facebook. Uh, they see they had, you know, and also too, there's talks about how out of touch so many of the Congress people are. And you can even look at our uh, judicial system too, where many people who have been in it for years are just very out of touch because they got into a habit or this habitual action with how things are supposed to run. But technology has basically, you know, thrown it left field. You know, it's thrown it a curveball basically, and they don't know what to do with it. And they think doing the same thing that they've been doing the past 50 years will fix it all. But again, you know, the difference between intelligence and insanity, right? If you're insane, you're gonna be doing something multiple times expecting different results and it's never going to happen. So, you know, we're getting into kind of a dangerous territory here, not us speaking, but you know, in the sense of at least in the US with our judicial system and the people in Congress just being so out of touch um, though it does help that many of them also do get uh, contributions from said corporations too. Another thing to throw out there. And again, not conspiratorial, it's just plain truth if you look at their donor lists. You can blatantly see it. Yeah, I wonder how many people Zuckerberg went up to when he was, uh, you know, there and just saying like, Hey, fancy seeing you here, Senator, <laughs> Congressman. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I, I will say this, too. And I actually brought this up to you when you first heard about it, about uh, Zuckerberg going up to Capitol Hill. I'm not saying that it isn't a massive issue what's going on with Facebook. And I'm not talking about the whole, you know, the whole thing with supposedly Russia interfering in the U.S. Um, 
politics this year. I, you know, I'm not, you know, or, you know, during the presidential run, I'm, I'm not going to get into that. And I'm not, I'm not talking about that. But overall, the ability to have access to one's data and who can control it, which could be anyone, doesn't matter where they're from, who they're working for, you know, whatever. The fact is that they have this much data and they're willingly utilizing it to try to manipulate outcomes, right? That's that's the big issue here. But I did mention to you though how it was interesting that there was be, there's been a lot of talk for the past probably six seven months. You know, everyone's saying, well, who's going to run on the Democratic ticket, for instance? You know, who's going to run? Is it going to be Oprah? Which I'm like, all right, stop there. We we already have a celebrity in the White House. Let's not keep doing this shit over and over to us. You know, two wrongs don't make a right. This isn't going to balance things <laughs> out. Um, but you know. Now people are saying there was a lot of talk too, saying, "Oh, maybe Mark Zuckerberg," and Mark Zuckerberg started going around, traveling around to different factories, different businesses, giving speeches, and it was really starting to look like maybe he'll run. Now he did right out say, um, "I'm not going to run. That's not my plan," but he was doing a lot of things to make it look like he's kind of building up a campaign, right? Now I just find it interesting that after six months or so of a lot of hype of him saying that suddenly now he has to go to capitol hill because of all these issues which originally stemmed from this whole concept of russia supposedly uh interfering with the election and mind you there's always a lot of things that are happening that are interfering with elections even the parties themselves interfere with the elections we've got to understand <laughs> that but you know it's just interesting that this is brought up during that point in time where we're starting to really see a peak a lot of people talking about it so many articles were being put out about it and suddenly out of nowhere whoop out of left field hey all this negative pr all this negative pr again not that i'm saying he's a saint he is absolutely not he comes off as a complete douchebag to me oh for sure yeah and he doesn't really know how to work with human beings so <laughs> there's that but also you know, there is the fact, though, that it's just kind of interesting timing. It's almost as if they already kind of knew he was doing all this stuff. They hear about the political run and then they go, oh, well, let's bring this out now. So that way he doesn't he doesn't have a chance of running. Right. Because he already has a lot of information on the public that he can use for his for his own benefit. Let's take him down a notch. Exactly. So that nobody will ever vote for him ever. And he'd have a lot of data on the on the running parties and on any of the competitors. Oh, yeah. So again, and I, I'm not saying that is the case. I don't want to start rumors or anything like that, but I want to put that thought out there. And hopefully, you know, maybe someone out there, including us, can find more information and see is that really the case or not. Maybe something might come to light. But I just want to point that out there because I think that's a very interesting. Um, what do I want to say? Like it's just it's just interesting timing is really the whole thing of it. So there is that. But that is not to then you know by any means spit on the fact of what is actually going on here uh but also too again we have a lot of people saying well you know tv uh the tv industry did this for years now for you know 50 some years where they looked at your age if you're male female are you at home are you single are you and the only thing though is with this we have to keep in mind that there is a difference between that and then where you search on the web what you personally like what you save into a cart on say a platform like amazon or like uh, flipkart or, or alibaba whatever you use there's a difference between that and your age sex and like general location because whether you're in public or private that never changes if you're 30 years old in your home you're 30 outside in a park you're 30 at the mall you're 30. but a lot of times what people engage with online can be vastly different than what they do out in public. Oh yeah. And that's where we start getting into concerns of true privacy, if that makes sense. And again, some people will say, well, that's kind of a thin line, but either way though, it is our own privacy. We assume as we are in our own home or studio or wherever you're at, that you, know, you are ideally in a private area where it's just you and the computer, right? But if all that information is being bled out like that, you know that only works against you it is that and that's really the big debate too is is that then uh infringing on our privacy well some would say well no the internet is a public area it's a public forum as if you were out in a park so that doesn't really count others would say yeah but this is different 
And that's a lot of what Congress and our judicial system is having a problem with too, which I think if anything, if you're gonna have a problem with the situation, that's at least a fair one to have. You know what I mean? I think that you could go either way with it. And it, it there's a lot of gray areas. So it's a lot of like, well, you know, it's not as clean and simple, I think, as many would like to think. Oh, definitely not. Well, just like with ads, right? We have some people in chat um, talking about ads, uh, essentially being, um, uh, you know, Trunk says that, you know, ad general, ads in general are manipulative and manipulation is not necessarily always a bad thing, right? Like we have that connotation on the word manipulation. Um, but I certainly uh, appreciate when I see an ad for something uh, that I would not otherwise come across, you know? So, you know, in some instances, uh, yes, I want to hear about the the new show that they're playing, uh, uh, you know, at this venue, or ooh, this particular item that I I didn't know existed, but really would make my life easier, and I want it, and it makes it, it makes everything better. Uh, ads can be good, right? Um, and advertising uh, can be good, but again, it's just another tool. And you know, I think with Facebook, they decided to you know, start the advertising as a revenue stream. And then from there figured out, wait a minute, we can get so much more data. Um, like that we can sell for more money or do more things with it, uh, in the future, you know, and then that kind of led, uh, them down this, I think, dark path <laughs> as it were. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, you know, Dalamaz says, too, and it's funny, but it's, it's again, all true about getting um, information. Well, I read a lot of sci-fi books of paranormal, so I buy a lot of e-books and books, and so my GF uses my Amazon Prime account to rent Fifty Shades of Grey. I'm sorry to hear that, because she'd never seen it. I, I added in the... I'm sorry to hear that. And uh, I get all of these harem softcore books in my Amazon oh, page. Nice. Made me go WTF and run through all my credit reports to see if my identity had been used. Yeah, I would imagine, right? Cause it's like, ah, I ain't looking at that. So, uh, anyone want to explain this to me? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm still definitely, um, you know, like, like, like people are talking in chat, like, you know, just delete your Facebook account, this and that, and it's all over. But that isn't the end all be all because, uh, Facebook has its, uh, its hands in a lot of different pots and you got to know which pots to throw out as well once you do that. Uh, and I know there's actually uh, some great articles online that detail how you can start to untangle yourself from the Facebook uh, catastrophe that is happening uh, if you so choose to do so. Uh, and it's it's more than just, yes, I want to delete my account um, as well. But um, and we'll, we can find some links of those um, as well. Put them up in the description on our Podbean and in our YouTube um, so you can get a chance to, to take a look at it. But uh, of course, you can also Google that as well. But if you do want to untangle yourself from from this craziness, uh, by all means, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to stop, uh, but it might mitigate the power that Facebook has if more and more of us start the process, I would say. Yeah, and I will say too that, you know, in many of these articles that we've read up on this situation, uh, they were, all of them were saying that Facebook actually holds more information on us than even Google does. And Google has been around probably about, I would say even, uh, even longer. I mean, Facebook's been around for 14 years. Google's been around much longer than that, if I remember right. And they've been collecting data ever since, right? Because they have to, they're a search engine. They want to make sure that your search is of high quality. At least that's how the search engine started. And that's why they started Gmail, because now they were in your private life. <laughs> yes, now they're getting data of like who you're emailing, what kind of newsletters you receive, things like that. So you think about how many people use Gmail, how many people use YouTube, how many people use um, Google as a search engine. And yet, even with all that, Facebook still has more data on you. And the reason why I bring that up though, is that Facebook can be a serious threat or a serious issue to all of our privacy and all of our data, but there are other companies out there who are catching up in a way and trying to find other ways to collect as much user data as possible. And so the big thing to remember on that is that you need to make sure that um, you are kept safe. 
and that you are not only going after the head of Facebook and like using torches and pitchforks, uh, but after them, but that you're also making sure that you're doing something overall that impacts all these companies. So that if you, and again, this is if you feel like this information should be private, I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm saying if you feel like this should be private, then this is probably what you should go by then and not just, again, headhunt one person and go, whew, okay, great, we stopped them, we slowed them down, I feel much better about myself. Because there are like 20 other companies right behind them in line doing the same thing. So if you want to stomp out a situation, you don't just put out, a, you know, like with a fire, for instance, and it spreads. You don't put out one half of it and go, well, the other half will burn itself out now because that one half is gone. No, it'll burn and find new ways to burn and keep burning and growing. So you got to stomp out the whole entire fire until it is snuffed out. But again, we get so cathartic with one result from one situation. You know, we win the battle, but we never win the war because we get so cathartic from the battle and go yeah we've done it we did it you know we went out there and protested or we did this or that but then take no action to make sure that the situation is cleared out and that it never happens again that's a good point and it's hard to really figure out the the nefarious uses that that someone will uh, inflict on a particular platform or process or system or software uh, sometimes until it is too late, right? Um, hmm. So it's it is important to like you know stay vigilant and and always just be aware of uh, one the information that you put out there uh, because obviously they would not be able to collect any of this information were it not for our searches and our activities and our willingness to expose so much of ourselves online, right? Because it is so easy. Uh, but imagine you know if some if Google sent a representative to come hang out in your living room. Right, you wouldn't be you wouldn't be exposing yourself in the same manner, or or maybe you would be. Right, depends on your on your comfort level, your privacy level, and that sort of thing. Um, but it is it, it's so easy to do stuff online. So it, it you know just um, just be mindful of it. And that's not to say you know we we have to lock ourselves up in, in our houses, never go online, never do anything. Uh, but just be aware that um, you know it's sort of like when you. Um, you know when you play games with your wallet right uh you have to you have to be mindful of of what you're doing look into the company uh you know if you're if your gut tells you that it feels wrong see why figure it out uh you know are there any other alternatives and that sort of thing um but it is it is hard right to uh be vigilant all the time about every little thing in the world right and we get that we're, we're not saying that that's uh that that's the answer um and hopefully some of these businesses will uh learn from some of this um although i feel like some of them will just say great uh let's make sure we don't get caught <laughs> oh yeah um, well and it's, it could be hard to to find alternatives that's the other issue right because right. you want to be like well i want to voice my opinion with my wallet but who else can I go to? Because this big company has already stomped out all of its competitors on purpose. So that way you really had no one else to go to. Um, and that's that's the sticky situation as well, is that we're so reliant on so many businesses because they've set themselves or they've set that situation up for us to be so reliant on them that you know it's sometimes easier said easier said than done because like it's not like we're an investor, we're not a CEO of the company, we don't have that kind of say. And if we stopped using them, not only is it like, well, it's one person for them, so what does it matter? But it kind of screws you out of a situation too, right? Where it's like, well, I have to order stuff or I have to go through this company because I don't have any alternative typically. That makes it tough too. And, and, that, and that's again where we have to then get into the politics of things, get representatives that do represent us, that know how to voice our opinion over a business's opinion and um, can actually get some regulations in place so there are protections for the consumer. Right. And Dalamaz br brings up a good point um, as well. You know, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Uh, remember, never give someone or the government or a company any power that you would not want another to have. Uh, you know, you can blame Facebook, but ignore Apple and Google, question mark, right? Um, so exactly that, you know, just be mindful of, um, you know, your actions do have power. And you know, one person's voice multiplied by many of those voices, you know, across the world, they do have an impact, you know, don't think that you're not um, 
able to make a change, uh, you know, to bring a, forth a change, uh, you by sharing that information with someone else, and that person will share with someone else and so on and so forth, you can actually, you know, create a movement that exactly. changes things. Yeah, and you know, we've talked about the protect the protection of data, uh, but now I actually, I mean, Tatiana, you're going to be talking about the protection of art. Art. Yes, during World War II, Brit Britain's National Gallery actually sent its collection of masterpieces into a Welsh slate mine. What? Is that safe for the art? Uh, so to protect the works from Nazi attacks, the National Gallery actually stored the paintings in an old slate mine uh, in Manod, North Wales. Now, during this time, this actually was not unusual. Of course, in London, the uh, Elgin marbles were hidden in, uh, I'm going to mis mispronounce all uh, these. I think it's Aldwych. Aldwych tube station. Uh, in Paris, the Louvre was actually emptied out uh, with 3,600 paintings packed off to safe houses. Uh, the Mona Lisa was actually shuttled around the country like five times from Chateau to Abbey. Um, and then again, the, the Nazis also did this. Uh, Hitler had, had plans to turn his hometown of Linz into a museum containing the world's art. Uh, and they stored many works in a salt mine in Austria. Uh, over like 6,500 paintings were stored, including the works of uh, Michelangelo, Rubens, Vermeer, Rembrandt. Now, during the storage of the National Gallery collection, uh, they had local men uh, employed to look after the paintings, and they were actually sleeping they slept in that mine for four years to keep those paintings secure during the war. Um, and the what good came out of it? Lots. Uh, the situation actually helped develop a, a new understanding of how best to store paintings, right? Because the National Gallery had no air conditioning system, so they had to closely monitor the paintings in, in controlled conditions. Um, and they even built a small studio outside the quarry uh, where they did a lot of the conservation work. And storing the works in Manod not only saved them from the Nazis um, and forced them to learn new ways of preserving the works, uh, but they were also able to store them there after the war um, as they were rebuilding the damage done to the gallery. Um, and they were able to take the paintings out uh, and showcase them to the poor British spirits, uh, you know, to boost morale. So there's a lot of benefits actually that, that happened for this. And that was, I think, a, a great smart move um, and not only by Britain but of course also um, the French to to protect these these paintings and these um, these artwork so you know how do we feel like their their quick thinking has impacted our society and culture I mean surely may, potentially some of these uh, artwork uh, may have not survived survived the, the constant bombings and attacks and and just outright theft depending on um, areas that were taken over uh, by the Nazi armies uh, during the war. So yeah, it's like you could have gotten a lot lost and stolen. Um, a lot of it just, again, damaged from war, whether it be through shrapnel, bullets, bombs, basically all the, anything that's nasty with a B that you could think of, it could have, you know, impacted these works of art. And, and there's been other major events where we have seen the art impacted, like uh, the Library of Alexandria. Right, through war, it be, it burned down, and we can only guess at how many works of art and literature and things were, were burned uh, in that. Yeah, and it's important to try to preserve these pieces of art um, and other sorts of, uh, you know, cultural um, cultural work, because one, I think it, it gives us a glimpse of, of course, the, the time period. Um, but also the creative expression of the artists and potentially what they were trying to say about their life and, um, and politics and all of that good stuff. Um, but it's also, uh, I think it's also important just from, you know, the visual aesthetic, the, the richness of our, uh, of our understanding of the human condition and that sort of thing, you know, it's, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a little bit how they say, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. It's interesting to see some of this artwork from the past um, really reflect a lot of the same, um, you know, values and morals that, that we hold dear today as well. And also to see how they are different. Well, and I think important. I think so many people too also get an emotional attachment to some of these artists based on, you know, what they've learned these artists went through. Um, what inspired them. And I think also, too, for many, it's a nice reminder within the art communities uh, when they can actually see the actual brushstrokes 
uh, say if they were with a, uh, say say if they are looking at paintings, being able to look at the actual brush strokes of said artist, because it's a nice reminder of that this was a real person who went through ups and downs, who who slept, who awoke, who ate, who you know breathed this art, and who had such a passion for it. And I think it's a nice reminder, and it helps people kind of break away from that desensitization of oh yeah that's a painting or oh yeah that's a rembrandt or oh yeah that's a vermeer or oh yeah that's you know so and so so and so it's a picasso yeah whatever but really going no this is a real person like you can see the brush strokes you can see the history and what's being laid out on this canvas and that can be very cool for many people for some they could care less and that's fine too nothing wrong with that but for some it really means a lot to them to be able to feel in a way somewhat connected to a person that they appreciate for their work. You know, and this is one of the closest ways of, of doing that. It's also just, um, it's nice to surround yourself with something that is not always just something that's functional, right? Like when you're in your house, uh, if you have pieces of artwork or a poster, or, you know, you have something that uh, essentially, um, there's a saying in Romanian, uh, it's loosely translated into English that something that washes your eyes, right? Like you're looking at something that beautifies your environment uh, in whatever way that works best for you. It reminds you that there's more, uh, I think, you know, to life than going to work, paying bills, you know, and that kind of thing. But it's really um, there to remind you that you're alive and it's to remind you to um, you know, take a moment and really experience life. At least, at least that's what it, it means to me. Um, so I think it's great that, you know, even in times of war, somebody somewhere was like, hey, we got to save this stuff. <laughs> well, and even the, the government there, too, um, was like, no, this needs to be a serious, you know, uh, this needs to be handled seriously. And they hired people to actually live in these mines for four years. These people lived and slept and ate down in the mines with the artwork while making sure and going through every single one making sure that all is accounted for that there was no damage being done and if they saw issues that they would take it up to that little quarry where they would do some preservation treatments to it as well to help preserve the artwork and so the fact that they took it that seriously hired people for four years during a time of war where all the money is being invested into melting down every single piece of metal you can for bombs and bullets and guns you name it and yet they were like you know what this is important enough where we really need to make sure to put it safe and to actually supply money toward that as well that's an important fund as well and i think a lot of it's a cultural thing now many of these painting uh these painters too are from italy and uh you know uh what i was like um norway or sweden or you know many other locations germany even actually um so you know they they were all over the place so it's not like they were just british works but i think from a cultural perspective though because they've been there for such a long time they kind of were like a staple for many of the people there and that was just a part of i think for many people there like part of their life you know if they grow up and they were able to to attend the museums and see the artwork and you know, I, I think that's also why they decided to actually take one piece at a time actually out um, of this uh, area after the war and showcase it and put it kind of out on parade, if you will, in front of the masses to help lift their spirits to go, hey, look, you know, they, they may have stripped us down of our buildings, but not of this culture, not of what's been a part of um, Europe as a whole, because they tried to divide Europe and they're not we're not going to let them do that, basically. What I find fascinating as well um, is that you know in in these times of war there's so many examples of the um, you know sort of the initiator of the of the whole thing um, or the aggressor that they actually do try to save the artwork themselves right um, and that to me is interesting because they're apparently not looking to just decimate an entire culture, uh, you know, and they're still uh, interested in preserving that artwork themselves. Like the Nazis had, uh, you know, the stolen art uh, that, that they took uh, was protected in some minds as well. Uh, obviously, there is a lot um, that is lost to the world at this point, um, at least their whereabouts. Um, and there's actually uh, lots of uh, TV shows actually out there now. Um, the Hundred on the CW uh, that showcases, 
you know, a post-apocalyptic world, uh, but there's a military bunker where the leader has actually stored and is preserving a lot of artwork, which I found was an interesting commentary, you know, um, on that. It's like, who, who cares? Like, you're just trying to survive. Why did you spend all these resources to grab paintings and these statues from the world, right? Um, and then uh, in the Lost, uh, oh, the last ship, um, also um, a TV show, you know, they show this uh, sort of madman who, um, uh, in Asia, who uh, is attacking um, a museum in Japan, but he stops to save one piece of artwork that he takes with him. So it's, it's fascinating because artwork seems to speak, you know, to everybody uh, at some sort of level where they feel the need to, even when they're, you know, full on in destruction mode, they feel the need to ser to save something, to hold on to something. Mm -hmm. I, I found that fascinating because, you know, in, in my head, somebody who is bent on, on, on destruction uh, doesn't have time to just, oh, oh, but this painting of roses is really beautiful. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm just gonna put that in my back pocket. All right, kill, kill, kill. You know, like it's, uh, it's fascinating. Oh yeah, well, I'm talking about psychology too. Trunk uh, brings up a very interesting point in chat. Said the Nazis had a stunning double standard. They outlawed modern art and collected it themselves. <laughs> Their cognitive dissonance is really staggering. Indeed. Well, and I think too, for many people who are trying to go up in power, they're afraid of art because it's expression and people are able to express themselves and because they could say well art is based on interpretation you know and maybe you're just interpreting it wrong it's kind of their escape their way of voicing their opinion without potentially being penalized or or or, or getting in trouble basically for said art and so people are scared with that because art can really move people because it can get people on an emotional level art can you know incorporate sound can incorporate the visual text um uh touch textures all these different things which really help bring out this sort of emotional response from people that nothing else really can because it's meant to do that right i mean really what what these artists are doing is visual psychology and they are masters at it and really know what to do to tell a story without saying a word and you know i think a lot of people are very very afraid of that they understand the power of that and how art could even you know outdo any single platitude that a politician or a dictator or what have you can say out on you know during a stump speech for example true and you know to to speak to modern art nowadays uh what's going to happen to art in the digital realm right because now we have artwork that exists not only physically tangibly in your in your hands uh, but it's also exists in the digital realm whether it was created there right like you made it in photoshop uh, or uh, it was a, a piece of art or a piece of art that was scanned from something that was real right like you took yeah. a picture of it or uh, you, you scan you know you try to reproduce it in some form or fashion digitally as well mm -hmm. And that's a good question as well, right? Like if I wanted to destroy all the digital art in, right now in the world, what do I need to do? Just send a virus everywhere, right? Like, is that how it goes? How am I going to preserve that? And how do you preserve something like that? Um, I think on the one hand, uh, the, this digital revolution has made it easier to one, create art uh, to, and two, distribute that art. So that's kind of interesting in and of itself because if I wanted to save, um, you know, physical artwork, that technically takes more resources and more time. And then you have to have, uh, you know, you have to conserve it. You have to you know, make sure that it survives X amount of time in wherever conditions you have it in. And with digital art, presumably all you just need is a, just one giant hard drive. <laughs> uh, but then, how do you collect all of that, right? And then are there are there digital museums that you could even put some of that stuff in, right? Well, and we've even discussed about how uh, several art museums are actually trying to put their works of art online. Okay. Uh, the system was actually created by one specific art gallery, and I don't remember the name right off the top of my head, but we do have it uh, in a previous episode a couple months back where we spoke about how they created a search engine basically where you could find all the art within their collection 
based on color, based on size. You know, it didn't have any, it didn't have to be just based on artist or location, like what many art galleries do. Like, oh, well, this is Renaissance art, or this is Italian art, this is uh, German art, or this is all, you know, Picasso, or this is all Rembrandt, or this is all this and that. No. What they said was, well, a lot of people go by what they first see. If they're not very familiar with art, they're not really like a connoisseur of art, then what they're gonna do is go by, well, I like the color turquoise. What do you have for me? You know, or I like paintings over sculptures, or I like um, glass works over jewelry. What do you have for me? And so they created an online digital search engine where you can do all of that. And so everything is associated by those specifics uh, based on the person interacting with the art rather than someone who's already kind of a part of that art scene. And, you know, they're putting all their work up online. So if you can't afford to fly out there, stay a couple nights and check out the museum, right? You can at least see it online. And they're trying to connect people to that artwork better. So we're seeing more and more of that. And it is open, soft, so, uh, open source software. So they're also making it available to anyone who wants to utilize it and, and create something specifically for their gallery or their their um, showcase or, or what, what have you. And that's really great. It, but you know what though? The other thing is though that there are so many smaller actual artists, people who are on uh, Behance or on some of these other websites trying to showcase their work. They're so concerned with protecting it that they almost don't want to put a lot of their artwork online so it's interesting while these art galleries are trying to put you know these much older works online so many artists now who create stuff right now are trying to take it offline because they're so worried about people taking it and then throwing it on a t-shirt throwing it on a mug uh people who are you know basically photoshopping it and then throwing it uh up on their wall as a poster because they went to staples saying hey i can make this into a poster and it's a hell of a lot cheaper than just buying the actual work of art and then that artist who put all that time into it and all hopefully their heart and soul into it they lose out on the the financial gains that they could be making off of their property off of their work Yes, uh, Zanka brings up a great point in chat that that illustrates that it's, it's much easier to steal digital art uh, than, uh, you know, IRL art, uh, unfortunately, just like that. Well, unless you're the Gardner Museum. Please elaborate. You know, the Gardner Museum, you're the one from Massachusetts, not me. Was it the uh, the Isabella oh, Gardner Museum or the something? Isabella Gardner Stewart. Uh, there was, yeah, right. They um, they stole, I, I think several um, different kinds of, of paintings and everything from uh, this woman's personal collection uh, that she had, and they still don't know who did it and where those things are at. And there's been some recent articles of the past wow. year where they're like, we think we might have found some from the collection. And I have no idea where that's all gone, but yeah. <laughs> so unless you're part of the that collection. Um, but yeah, it is a lot easier for digital, right? I, again, it, as mentioned, people can copy and paste and pull from your website if you're trying to showcase your artwork to say, hey, look what I could do. Great, thanks, clip. They could screenshot. They could do so many things uh, where you're not protected and you don't get the benefits of all of your hard work. Right, and that includes things also um, like music and films and yeah. TV shows, right? That's not just the visual art, uh, but also all the other different like art Entertainment mediums. art forms, and yeah. Which, again, is, is the, the pro and the con of being in this digital era, right? Because, again, that means that distribution is faster, easier, better, right? Like you said, yeah, I don't have to travel to... Um, you know, I don't actually have to travel to the Louvre to see the Mona Lisa. Uh, I can just uh, see it online. I can uh, buy a copy of someone from, you know, that someone had recreated on Etsy and so on and so forth. But at the same time, um, that does tend to dilute the artwork. Um, it also tends to um, exactly uh, uh, not properly um, compensating the artist. Uh, means that you, in theory, don't really have a respect for the art, even as much as you, you know, you wanting to own the art and see it and have it in your own home um, or for your own enjoyment, you're actually uh, doing a disservice uh, to the artist, to yourself, and to, you know, culture as a whole. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, and, and um, Azanka One also says, worst part is, they can just tweak the colors. They can call it an original art. They can use blur, crop, smudge, a little this and that, and it's done. And now it's their own work. And the thing that's scary too is that a lot of businesses, 
uh, are doing the same thing to artists where they're like, well, we don't want to pay an artist to um, either do our marketing or we don't want to pay an artist to uh, create original work from the stuff we do own uh, that we do have uh, an IP on. We don't want to do that. We, do, we don't want to pay someone. So what do they do? They rip off another person's art that's based on their IP, which the, again, that artist is allowed to do depending on how they do it. And then they put it on bags and books and all this other stuff and then sell it. We actually, again, did another story where Disney got in really hot water because an artist in college had posted up an image that she did of Alice in Wonderland. So what did someone from Disney do? They took that image, uh, even though I'm sure they'll say it was a third party, they took that image and they put it on a purse and on a backpack and on a few other things and started selling that artwork uh, on their own products. And so, but again, they did not compensate the artist. They did not uh, give her any credit for the artwork she did, but you could clearly see by a side by side comparison that it is her work that they took. Um, but the other thing is too, is that then they also got in trouble again, Disney did for taking artwork that a French artist did uh, or a Moroccan, I can't remember. I think it was a French artist though, who they took the artwork uh, from uh, a, a series of albums that he that he had uh, created artwork for and then they turned it into the um, artwork for the solo movie so they took the typography the colors the style and everything and they made it into those marketing posters and then again Disney said oh well it was a third party marketing company we're going to look into it and we're going to change the marketing which they did very little changing they did some but the colors are still there the influence the is still clearly there right um, and Trunk brings up a good point as well that, you know, um, copies are, are much easier in the long view or, you know, uh, if you have copies of artwork uh, that will in the long view, you know, over thousands and thousands of years uh, may radically increase the chance that it might survive. Right. So as opposed to like, oh, this is the only, uh, you know, if this Mona Lisa ever gets stolen or destroyed at the Louvre, it's OK. We have plenty of copies in the world everybody can get a chance to enjoy that artwork in some form or fashion yeah at least it's not a hundred percent loss it sucks that you lose the original right because you you lose that sort of as i was saying that direct connection to the artist but at the same time at least the the story behind it is still there you know the thing that inspired so many can still continue to inspire many as well and that's what we really have to look at too not saying it's okay to just burn every all the original works and because we have digital copies who the fuck cares but just that at least there is that that support in a sense of using um the digital format for those type of works so again it's a it's a uh it's one of those issues right where if you're talking about digital art uh that is where it's good and bad <laughs> And hopefully uh, people do the right thing. And, uh, you know, certainly if you use artwork or um, whether it's for your own enjoyment or you're you're using it and tweaking it and trying to sell it as your own, you know, um, give the credit to the artist. Try to compensate them as best as you can. Or, or if you can't, don't do it. You know, like um, <laughs> there's plenty of art out there or, or stock, stock imagery or... or um, you know, stock footage, that sort type of thing, where the artist has, you know, allowed uh, a site to use their artwork uh, for a specific purpose. You know, uh, try to use that kind of imagery. You know, you want to, especially if you want to make money off of it, right? Uh, you wouldn't like it if that's what happened to you. So don't do it to other people. <laughs> and I know we went a little bit off topic here than our original story, but uh, that tends to happen. <laughs> Well, I mean, it wasn't really off topic. I mean, the main goal was to say not only about what happened in this specific situation, but then you had mentioned too, well, where do we go from here? And sort of, you know, now that we are going into the digital age, what do we expect to happen with this art too? Is it good? Is it bad? Um, so I think we were, you know, really sound there. We've had some great conversation in chat as well. So again, thank you for everyone thus far who has been throwing out uh, questions and comments and being really engaged. We, again, always really appreciate you. And of course, for those listening via podcast, again, make sure to join us live as well on Twitch. That is, of course, twitch.tv slash mindmindtv every Saturday at 1 p.m. PDT. 
and you'll be able to join us live and in the chat room to let us know your thoughts. And, you know, talking about sharing thoughts and opinions, this one, this next story has really struck a nerve for many people and many stories have been shared because of this specific situation. So we're going to talk about a very specific story that happened recently, but we're also going to go a little bit broader and talk about how we came about this story. Why did it become news in the first place? How did this become available to us because of um, what we're going to be talking about? So without further ado, YouTube and Twitter, they are the ones that really turned the Philadelphia Starbucks story into news. So if you're not aware, April 12th in Philadelphia, two black men were removed from a Starbucks by police at the behest of the store of the store's manager. The manager says they tried to use the bathroom without buying anything. Uh, because of the call, though, in the end, the two men were then arrested for trespassing. Now, uh, to be clear, after digging through, because some articles do mention this, some articles don't, but at least based off police reports, supposedly what had happened was that these gentlemen had entered into um, this Starbucks and they had asked to use the restroom and they were actually just hanging out there waiting for a friend to come by and they were supposed to, I think, have a conversation from what we understand about real estate. They were going to have a few different... Um, talks about something going on between the three of them and so the two friends were there waiting for a third to arrive and they asked to use the restroom to which the uh, employees said well you know unfortunately because of our area everything else and the amount of people that come through here like we are only allowed to offer the restroom to paying customers so the men did not buy anything and they were sitting there waiting for their third friend to arrive so the manager supposedly again from police statements said that the manager had walked up to him to let them know they need to leave uh because they are trespassing unless they were to purchase something so a coffee a scone you name it and they would been all sudden they could use the restroom um but the men then supposedly were cursing at the manager and uh, arguing, arguing with her, which then led to the, uh, the store manager calling the police. Uh, and then within a few minutes, the police were there and uh, pretty much instantaneously arrested them uh, for trespassing. Now, a patron recorded a video and posted it to Twitter, which it then went viral. Then a second video was uploaded to YouTube shortly after. So now really, situations like this happen often now whether you look at it from the race perspective unfortunately it happens way too often in the u.s uh and if you look at it from just again people not listening to people who own a specific property this could be a starbucks it could be a mcdonald's it could be really any location um any kind of store or restaurant that you frequent for many people just kind of walk around and trespass. You know, they're soliciting is basically what you see. You'll see plenty of signs that say no soliciting, right? So no matter the situation you look at, you know, this does happen, unfortunately, quite often. Uh, so how did it become such big news though so quickly as many of these stories tend to just get overlooked? Well, it's because of the videos and how they were shared on social media. And because they were shared on social media, the ability to be able to spread information so quickly made it so readily available to so many people at once that people couldn't ignore what was going on here. And because of the videos, the incident has become national news. The CEO of Starbucks, Kevin Johnson, even apologized and announced that all Starbucks employees will soon undergo training to recognize unconscious bias. Uh, this training will actually have 8,000 stores closed on May 28th for the training. The CEO also met with the two gentlemen and stated that the specific store manager no longer works with the company. Now, with that said, though, there are some gray areas that have been brought to the attention of certain journalists who mentioned that really uh, the manager was not let go at first. And only after there were protests in Starbucks did the manager then meet with the CEO to which so they, many say um, they both agreed on the manager leaving the company. Uh, from a community standpoint, it's also launched, as we said, multiple protests. And these protests actually filled up Starbucks locations all around because of their disagreement with the arrests. Uh, now, for all the flaws that we've talked about, like Facebook having all of our data and everything else, it seems that social platforms can do a great service of helping people capture and surface stories that most traditional news outlets don't 
don't normally cover. They they ordinarily overlook it. Or and, aren't there at the time that it happens, so there's no way for them to even cover it. Exactly. All they can do is a lot of hearsay and not get that live footage of the actual incident happening right away. Uh, and so because of this, we're able to capture that. And so, you know, our discussion today is not only going to be about the issue that happened at the Philadelphia Starbucks, but also this idea of citizen journalism. Because honestly, a decade ago, this type of journalism was scoffed at. Um, most professional journalists actually were originally just terrified of an army of uh, <laughs> citizens roaming around looking for news while being while willingly doing it for free. Right. And journalists wanted the meaty um, discussion points because, again, that's how they kept their job. And that's how hopefully they get that raise and, and it cements them into their position. But if you have a ton of people who are willing to work for free, that could be very, very intimidating. Right. Um, but again, are these journalists able to capture things like many of these other citizen journalists tend to capture? Most of the time they can't, right? They're either behind a desk or they're investigating one specific issue that they can't cover everything. And as we've talked about in the past too, many of these newsrooms have been actually getting rid of more and more of their journalists. And now you have fewer journalists doing more work. And they've actually had to try to introduce things like AI to try to help write some of the articles uh, with that, which that AI is being fed by the journalists based off all the research that they've been doing. We've talked about the Washington Post, for example, that's been doing this now for quite some time. Uh, so, you know, with this, though, it's assumed that citizen journalists would only just mimic or mirror professional journalists. You would think, well, they'd go for the big stories, right? But sometimes it's the smaller stories that they really latch on to because it's their community. They feel truly invested in it to it because it's their surrounding areas. It's the people that they know and interact with on a daily basis. And so, of course, too, they can't do the big stories because they're also um, there's also limitations of resources. Uh, they're not as equipped, per se, for handling some of the things. They're not going to be reporting on things from Syria or the things from Washington, D.C. if they're out of California or Portland, Oregon. Right. But they could definitely report the hell out of their local areas. And if anything, a lot of times they have better connections to the people in their community to get better information than from uh, an actual professional, quote unquote, journalist. And um, as writer Justin Peters states, the news videos that go viral on social media often documents acts of shocking official pettiness that provoke immediate emotional reactions. Uh, United Airlines, uh, Airlines passenger forcibly removed from an airplane, the University of California Davis police officer who pepper sprayed a group of protesters sitting peacefully on the ground, among many other situations. And actually, you know, thanks to many of these citizen journalists, there have been they've been able to capture enough smaller incidences uh, that enough individuals are able then to string them together into a much larger story. Uh, so, for instance, people are attributing a situation at a uh, Starbucks in California in January. Um, they're attributing this as being one of those links uh, to then connect to this issue in Philadelphia of this kind of racial bi bias or profiling where they would potentially call the police on uh, those that are African-American, but not someone who's white or, or Asian-American or Latino or Hispanic, for example. And so uh, basically let you know in January at a Starbucks in California, what had happened was someone had took a video, uh, presumably the black customer who had actually gone up to ask um, to use their bathroom and they were a customer. They had actually purchased something and they were denied the use of it. But then this gentleman asked a white customer to ask to use the restroom to which uh, they let that individual use it, whether it was through a code or um, like a little punch code or they had to buzz you in. I'm not sure of that specific situation, but that was all captured on video and put online for people to show. So it's not even the fact that this is a unique incident. We can see now because of this kind of citizen journalism that there are uh, many locations that are kind of going through this situation where there seems to be clearly this kind of racial bias in a way whether the people in the story were right or wrong the fact is that the consequences seem to be much harsher to certain groups of people than to others potentially yeah there's there's a lot to unpack here right there's the whole conversation about starbucks as a company right they have thousands of locations worldwide right um 
for example, there's 8,000 stores that are going to be closed on May 28th. That kind of gives you an idea of how many stores there are. So when we look even at the statistic of these issues happening, um, at least the ones that have been documented, it's at two stores out of 8,000, right? Now, obviously, some of this may be happening at other types of stores, at other types of restaurants that maybe aren't such um, a big name or aren't so prolif uh like um, a lot like having a lot of these stores right so if we're looking at statistics then we're just dealing with also looking at uh, the response of certain individuals right it's hard to uh, you know I know the CEO was sort of uh, taking responsibility for what happened in in the way of of training and policy making and everything like that which was admirable mm -hmm. admirable uh, but at the same time you're dealing with 8,000 different store managers right like we're all different people and uh, in certain situations potentially react differently, even when we have policy or procedures that we can like lean on, right? So there, there's, a, there's that piece. Um, then there is the larger piece of um, racism in America and, and the, the uh, you know, police um, and police arrests of black individuals um, and, and that whole arena where uh, everybody's sort of, sort of hypersensitive uh, to the issue and that clouds can cloud their judgment uh, both when they're um, the you know the perceived perpetrator or the perceived victim as well as when when they are the the police officer um, so there's that issue then of course there's also um, the civilian journalism that, that Evan, Evan was talking about um, you know can be used for good for sure because having somebody right there you know boots on the ground uh, literally capturing what is happening in real time is invaluable uh, but as some people have said in chat as well we only have the end of that situation captured on video right we can't say for sure what happened before uh, and we um, certainly um, you know the the videos that we see can also be edited in a in a way right uh, they may have that person may have captured the whole thing but maybe they only posted the end of the video to get that specific reaction out of us um, and I think you know uh, civilian um, journalism as opposed to uh, the ideal of, of professional journalism uh, where you can uh, remain somewhat objective uh, while bringing some subjectivity to it um, because we're human beings um, but I feel like a lot of um, you know civilians who don't have um, let's say any journalistic uh, training uh, may not uh, be able to distance their own emotional and and their own bias uh, and their own emotional reaction and experience and past uh, baggage uh, from what's happening and what they see versus what's actually might be happening right um, like if uh, what if that person had just walked into the store and only witnessed the end of it they might jump to a particular conclusion snap a video post it on Twitter and say Starbucks sucks boycott right um, so it, it's it's hard to um, you know I, I see both sides of, of that you know in terms of civilian journalism you know uh, some reporters looking at it as if oh, you don't even have all the facts yet, right? You're just jumping to a conclusion. But at the same time, that person happened to be there at that time. So they were able to at least capture some moment of it, uh, which uh, can sometimes be worse, sometimes can be better, right? So there's there's a lot to uh, there's a lot to unpack there. And I know that we have uh, some very good conversations in chat going on right now. Um, let's see. Well, while you catch up on that, too, I just want to make, you know, one quick point as well, that at least from a citizen journalistic perspective, it is important, I think, to have boots on the ground, to have people there. You know, for instance, we wouldn't know about all the things that happened um, during Standing Rock uh, with the, the, the whole issue with Dapple and, and everything, or we wouldn't know about Flint, Michigan and the water crisis that they're having. I mean, the U S yes. is honestly having a severe crisis right now with water contamination, not only just in Flint, Michigan, but also in Indiana, Ohio, uh, I believe areas of Pennsylvania where the, uh, iron and lead content is, is huge and it's just really undrinkable but the governments are doing nothing about it well it's too expensive to change the pipes and all these other things that you know all these other excuses 
And all of that would not really be brought to light if it wasn't for, you know, citizen, uh, civilian journalism, because a lot of these big corporate media companies don't want to get involved with that because not only is it that they think of it as a more small local story perhaps but also because a lot of the companies that are at fault for these issues are the ones also buying advertising from these big media outlets because that's how they make their money is off of advertising so the more views they get the more hits they get on a video or through um, their actual channel on TV on TV the more money they can charge people to advertise on their site and that's what really matters to them to keep things going to keep the lights on the doors open everything else whereas with a citizen journalist they are civilian journalist they're not worried about that they're worried about just getting the news but as you said clearly you know a lot of times emotions can get out of the way without that kind of proper training or understanding because you get so swept up into it that it's really hard to distance yourself a little bit so that way you can you know share a concise image of what really is going on and at least if anything you know if you're going to take on that so that civilian journalist role just make sure that you understand that you really do have an obligation to the people you're reporting that information to and to not just insta jump onto it but make sure you have everything so that way we can share it out because a lot of what we saw at least with this philadelphia situation and again i wasn't there it's hard to say what the hell really happened we have a lot of different accounts we have police reports saying one thing and we have people saying well police reports can say anything they want to help protect themselves of course which happens multiple times when it comes to an african-american being involved in an arrest again it's tough right because we hear so many situations on one side so many situations on the other side we try to then compound those big situations into this one specific situation thinking that everything fits perfectly and then it just becomes what it's really called a clusterfuck. I mean, there's no other way of putting it, right? It gets so muddy down. And of course, if you try to look at it from a very black and white perspective, no race included in that, no pun intended on that. Um, but if you really look at it from a, a, that specific perspective and push everything out of the way, then you get called an asshole and that you're crazy because it's like, well, yeah, but all this stuff happens. You, you're so naive. And it's like, well, unfortunately, you kind of have to be because we're getting too many emotions stuck into this, too. We have to really look at this. Otherwise, what we're creating, as Denise kind of mentions, is a sort of mass hysteria. You know, for instance, everyone's like, hashtag boycott Starbucks. OK, but did Starbucks make the arrest? They have no power to arrest anyone. So if you disagree with the arrest, maybe you should be hashtag boycott that police department. Now, I'm not saying to. Again, I, I can't speak either way. And many people look at me and say, well, this is a white dude. So what the hell does he know? Fair enough. I can only say, you know, and share what I know. So whether right or wrong, again, this is why we have these conversations. So we can hear from all sides. But, you know, I would say that again you know when we look at it the situation was these people these gentlemen refused to leave but again yeah does it happen at many starbucks where i've seen multiple people of other you know um backgrounds come into a starbucks and not get kicked out yet they brought up their laptop and they're just hanging out not buying a coffee hell yeah i have but i've also personally thought kick their ass out too <laughs> yeah so i mean if you're going to do rules make sure they're equal among everyone that's the biggest thing and what's interesting too is one of the gentlemen arrested did say well i understand that rules are rules but what's right is right and wrong is wrong <laughs> which is like what what are you trying to say well, wait sir? so that that says that you clearly understood that you were breaking the rules of the store and that you were going against them and what you did technically was wrong but then what you're trying to say then is that but you know this technically shouldn't be wrong because or what i did shouldn't have been wrong because the rules are what's wrong which seems a little odd i don't know to me it, it didn't really connect like i didn't it didn't make sense to me it's like i know i fucked up but i only fucked up because of you know the system is fucked up well okay well if you owned a restaurant or a store and people were just sitting there refused to buy anything was taking up table space you know, for more people to come in who did buy something, who want to enjoy themselves there and want to use the restroom and can, because you got to remember too, that when you pay $4 for a cup of coffee, that goes into everything that helps run that store. I mean, that's really the basics of it, right? The air conditioning, the lights, the, um, the Wi-Fi, Wi the bathroom, the water, the, the space, the rent, the chairs, the furniture that's there. I mean, everything. 
Yeah, and you could say too, but yeah, but Starbucks is big enough, they can afford it. And again, that's a whole other different kind of argument. And then what we're really doing is really convoluting the situation even more so. But to look at it from that core perspective, if, you know, again, what people pay for covers what's there. And if you're not paying for it, do you really have the right to be there? And I would say for anyone, no matter race, no, you don't, you know, get out. Like, unless for some reason, like for instance, if you need um, an area to, to stay safe, like if someone's chasing you down or something like that, and you need a place to, to kind of hang out and be safe in a public area until maybe police come or someone comes to pick you up, hell yeah, how's that person? Get that person in there, let them use the bathroom, let them do what they need to. But if they just want to hang out just to hang out, go to a library. Go to other places that are open. Go to a public park. Why are you at a Starbucks or why are you at a place where they're here to provide a service and you're not using said service? Oh, the Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi. Well, yeah. But it's like, you know, and again, that's that's completely pushing race out of the question here, out of the story here. But yes, is there a severe issue, especially notoriously known in Philadelphia uh, between the police, who many of them happen to be white and African-Americans? Hell fucking yeah, there are. You know, and hell yeah, there are plenty of issues where, again, a white person does something. Like, for instance, if you look at cannabis in the U.S. for the places where it's not legalized, typically there are a lot more white people with cannabis who are smoking up than African Americans. But guess who has the higher rate of being arrested? African Americans. Again, you can do deduction from there. So I understand why this is a hotbed topic and why this is getting so fired up and firing up so many people, but just make sure then that you focus on the right things, like overall change. Don't just say, well, let's boycott Starbucks. That doesn't overall change anything. You know, don't just say, you know, let's go after these Starbucks when there's people there working who are every single race and nationality and background working for these places, trying to make a living. And now you're taking away customers in time that they could actually be getting paid to do their job. You know, you're you're not just you're not really hurting the CEO any. You know, you're not hurting the overall company. They're large enough where they can make a PR campaign that makes your head spin. Like they can do that. So if you really want to change things, you know, for instance, just make get open conversations. You know, you know, demand town halls with your politicians, your representatives. Demand town halls with the police department, and really make sure that your point is laid across. And that if you want to, you know, protest, do it outside the police department. Then again, I'm not trying to, you know, incite anything, but I'm saying, though, that, you know, look at who has the power in the situation. Yes, Starbucks, the manager did not have to call at all. They didn't. But from the way it sounds, they also did not have the opportunity to join anything or to do anything else. She tried talking to them. They evidently cussed her out from what the police report says. Again, it's hard to say what's real, what's real. And so for us, it's up to us just kind of get the conversation started, at least try to help focus people's, you know, energy and, and rightful rage into something positive, into something that actually has a direction that actually can change things. Because boycotting Starbucks would not change anything. Doing hashtags boy boycott Starbucks on Twitter doesn't do anything. And yes, they they have made changes, but also Starbucks has been pretty well known uh, for having a very, I would say, like, I don't want to say like liberal liberal perspective, but in a way have. And I and I'm not using that as a is a derogatory word, as many people have used that word uh, in politics. But they do have typically they try to, in, you know, like endorse things and push things that have an overall community or humanistic side to them, whether it's always like that through everything they do is another story. I can't say I don't work for Starbucks. I'm not a representative. I can't tell you. But from the outside looking in, that's what we typically see, right? So of course it makes sense that they do something like this in the sense of the training and closing down the stores and doing the public apologies, meeting with the people, everything else to try to quell this hysteria because that's kind of the image they've created, whether true or not. They're trying to you know, follow up with it and try to stick with it. Yeah, and I think, I mean, communication actual open honest conversation and communication i think would have helped in this situation as well as in many situations uh right between the manager and the two guys you know like uh instead of you know cussing her out because she said hey you can't use the bathroom until you purchase something they could have said okay cool we understand the rules but i really need to pee would you mind just this one time i'm just here waiting for my friend and maybe she would have been like okay fine right uh like try to appeal and tell tell the truth right because they didn't want to use the bathroom just to 
tag it, I don't think, you know, they probably just needed to go pee. Um, and, uh, you know, if she had maybe talked to them again in, uh, because who knows what her tone was, how she said it, right? Uh, her attitude, maybe if she again was just trying to say, hey, I understand that you need to go to the bathroom, but you know what? My policy doesn't let me do this, this, and that. Would you like to purchase this lollipop for 99 cents plus tax and <laughs> get you get you going to the bathroom, right? So there's a lot of different things where they could have just talked with each other. And then let's say the police did arrive. Again, the police report uh, does say that the men were asked, quote, politely three times, unquote, to leave. Again, obviously we don't know when that video started because by the time that video started, they were basically already being arrested, right? So maybe there was a conversation that the police had with them and they said, hey, you guys are trespassing, you need to leave. No, what did they say in return, right? Like if I was asked three times, politely, quote unquote, uh, to leave an establishment, and I knew I was in the wrong, as one of the gentlemen said that he knew that rules were rules and wrong is wrong. Why? Well, I, I wouldn't stick around. I would leave. I'd be like, all right, fuck it. I'm going to go pee somewhere else, right? Um, or again, explain the situation. Dude, I just need to pee right now. If not, I'm going down my pants, right? Like, I feel like if all of these people just took a moment and tried to be empathetic to the other person's situation, but as well as try to explain their situation, and have that open communication, this may have all been avoided as some other things could be avoided, right? I feel like a lot of times, um, as Trunk mentions in the in chat, you know, tagging or organizing stuff is how the brain works. It is the only way to avoid information overload. Sometimes it's not even conscious in most cases, right? So what each of us can do is try to be aware of our own categorization and our own uh, Folk bias. Folk psychology. And avoid prejudgment. Yeah. Um, and I think that's so true. You know, like um, when we were talking about this conversation, you know, like I, I had my own safety biases, right? I'd say like, man, if I was a manager in a sticky situation and I did not feel safe because of my own bias, um, I might have not done anything either, right? So, but again, I was making an assumption based on like some of the articles I was reading and then I was reading some other articles like, oh, that situation was actually very different than, than what this one article made it out to be, right? So it is um, it is very important to try to stay calm as well and really look at a, at a situation as rational as possible um, which can be tough, right? We all come with our own baggage, our own experiences, um, and our own biases. And so we have to be aware of that and really just try to figure out, hey, that's another person just like I'm a person. And they got pretty much the same basic needs I do. Let me try to talk to them like a human being. <laughs> and then if that doesn't work, okay, then I'll call the police. <laughs> Or uh, I, I guess uh, you know try to try to do something else. And Crazy Doc um, again brings up a good point. You know, one person is smart, but you get people in a group. <laughs> people are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it. <laughs> oh yeah, it's it's very true. Again, you get this hysteria, and again, it's all for. We're not saying it's not for a good reason, right? Like there is a legitimate right. concern based on the system we have of inequality. It's severe, whether it's based on money, based on background, where you grew up. There are so many things, but it's been especially heavy to those who are black in America. It is fucking horrible for many of them. I remember, so I had a good friend of mine, actually, who uh, was put into um, basically like special education. And it was because he was black. I mean, he was, I mean, he, again, he was kind of like a little bit of a slower learner, but there was nothing mentally wrong with him. Like he was quick in many other areas. It was just certain areas that he just, it wasn't for him. Right. And there probably just wasn't the interest. And, you know, I didn't know at that time that that was actually happening in many schools against African-American children. I had no idea. I just thought, well, this situation's really screwed up. These guys are idiots. But I thought, oh, maybe it's just my school. But no, it clearly wasn't because I heard many other stories from others who were like, yeah, I got put in that situation too. I was African-American. I didn't have a lot of money. They didn't see a lot of hope in me. So they just put me in special education and left me there. And again, that happens. So we know that there is severe inequality. 
But again, we don't want to then associate to certain things and use those outside sources as kindling for a situation where there might not actually be a direct connection. And we're just using a lot of bias. He's saying, yes, there is. You got to see it. See right there, right there, right there. All right, well, let's calm down for a second. Okay, like until we actually talk to the people, see all the evidence, see what's happening here. We just want to make sure because we don't want to make the situation worse than it is. Or we want to make sure that the right people, at least if it is the, the situation we think it is, that the right people are are being held accountable for it and not just any anyone and everyone. And that's the problem that we're trying to avoid here. And so, so civilian journalism can be great in pointing out the issues, but we still need people to then work out the harder facts and more information out of it. And so, I mean, overall, too, I think that if civilian journalists can actually work with um, these professional journalists, quote unquote, <laughs> and, and, and really hit on the facts that are important and, and do the right job, we can have amazing news and we can really get great benefits from it on how to then move forward and improve our communities, improve our overall uh, welfare. Uh, but until then, you know, it's tough, right? We get people who have, you know, no incentive but to help, but sometimes the emotional gets in the way or they don't know everything at the time either. Right. And so there's no kind of clear filter for that. And uh, also real quick, I just want to welcome Arziz from Turkey. Thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate you. Thank you so much. Yeah, and uh, I think civilian journalism is good for certainly bringing awareness that something is happening. And then, you know, we need a little bit more digging into, well, what is happening um, just so that people don't jump to conclusions one way or the other. Um, because that I think is the problem in a lot, like, like I was saying, it's the problem in a lot of these situations is people were already jumping to conclusions, uh, long before anybody captured it on tape, you know, um, right. as it were. Um, and Dalamaz, uh, brings up a good point in chat as well. You know, uh, for example, if you are sworn in in a court of law for, you know, and they ask you for the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And we rarely get the whole truth. Um, yes and no, right? Because uh, your mind also sort of replays a situation in your brain, um, both one, the way that you think that you saw it, <laughs> uh, based on you being there, uh, but also our minds are tricky, right? Because we're, um, we, because of our biases, but because of our past experiences, but also because of the way that our brains are wired to work, the way we remember something, and especially by the time you get to court, which sometimes happens to be months later, um, but even when you're fi filing a police report just a, you know, a few hours later, what you actually experienced and what actually happened might actually be different from what you remember of that experience. Oh yeah, we've, we've mentioned this in multiple episodes too, where we're like, two people can look at the same situation, but based on the baggage they bring with them, uh, even if it could be similar baggage, you know, for instance, maybe two individuals who are um, African-Americans seeing this situation are watching it and they could have two completely different perspectives on it. I mean, we, we've seen it in the political arena, too, where we're like, wait a minute, how can you support something like this when this impacts, you know, you and others in, in your community? And they're just like, well, this is my perspective of it. We get this all the time. Right. And so it's 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 shocking to many of us because we look at some go. But no, this is reality. Like you're in front of me. I can touch this. I can poke it like I can see it. Like I know what's happening. I can hear. I can feel I can sense. This has got to be reality. But again, it's all about perspective, too. Again, we can see a glass, but some people focus in on the design of the glass. Some people focus in maybe on what's in the glass. Again, the, our, the, what we focus in on and what we pinpoint and how our brains take in the information, just vastly different, as you said. Right, and even you know, looking at this video that only shows sort of the end of what happened, um, I know I've been in uh, many Starbucks's or, or you know, in any public space where you're you're kind of caught up in what you're doing, and then all of a sudden you hear something, right? You hear somebody yelling, you hear something, uh, the loud noise, and you look up, and even if you were to start recording at that point in time, you have no idea what happened right before, right? You don't know if a person is trying to defend themselves from another person. You don't know why that person is chasing that other person down the street. You just have no idea. Um, so it's from that point as well, uh, even if you remember that particular incident correctly, once you started becoming aware of it, it doesn't mean that you knew what happened before, right? Like who knows, maybe these guys come, come in, came into the Starbucks before and uh, 
did shitty stuff or shady things or cursed at the manager, maybe that was her last straw, you know? Um, so it's, it's hard to tell um, that. Uh, maybe she was having a bad day and just way overreacted to what was happening, right? And she didn't have the capacity to just sit down and have a conversation with those guys. So there's a lot of other factors as well um, that just complicate a story because as the more people you have involved in this, in an altercation, right? The more uh, uh, passions you're gonna have, the more biases you're gonna have, and the more um, the more different mindsets you're gonna have. And it's it's just so important to talk to one another, y'all. You know. <laughs> yeah, and I think to really round this out too, it's not only to talk to one another, but look at multiple sources. Don't just trust the first uh, individual who shares a video on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, and don't just take that for face value and say that's the end all be all. And just like that, don't also take a publication in, no offense, but let's just say The Guardian, for example, or BBC or any other major you know, media outlet and take that as the end all be all. Because again, we had to go through and comb through multiple resources to actually find all of the specifics. Some people left out certain things, whether I don't know intentionally or not. Uh, but some articles mention one thing, other articles didn't mention it at all. Some articles mentioned something slightly different. And so you're gonna get so many variables that in the end, you just have to take a few of them if you really feel this information is important to you and put the time and investment into it to do just a little bit more additional research and not just rely on one source, again, as that end all be all source for your information on what's going on around you. So like for instance with us, don't just take what we're saying at face value. Look it out yourself. You know, yeah. in our in our um, discussions, in our descriptions for our videos and everything else, we always put the resource links of where we get a lot of our information from. So make sure to visit those resource links as well. Make sure to dive in and do some searching yourself and see where there's other information. Our job here is not to just tell you the news, but to give you stepping stones so that way you can further progress in understanding a potential subject and where you can take it. Indeed. All right. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the way science is doing good stuff for us. <laughs> yeah, instead of selling your data through, si <laughs> through uh, data science and through uh, science of uh, social media and how we respond, respond psychologically. <laughs> um, scientists have actually um, improved a, a naturally occurring enzyme that can actually digest some of our most commonly polluting plastics. Um, now, typically PET or uh, polyethylene terephthalate, PET, um, is the most uh, common uh, polymer resin of the polyester family. And it's actually used in fibers for clothing and containers for like liquids and foods, AKA plastic bottles uh, and so on and so forth. And um, typically that PET takes hundreds of years to break down. Uh, but the modified enzyme, uh, PETase, uh, can start breaking it down in just a few days. This, this is like a breakthrough for recycling process, right? Um, alone, the uh, UK consumers use around uh, 13 billion plastic bottles a year, uh, but more than 3 billion of that are not even recycled. Uh, the, the enzyme was um, actually discovered in, in Japan, and it's produced by a bacterium which eats this PET because the bacterium uses the plastic as an energy source. So that's really great. We're, we're making lots of food for this bacterium. <laughs> we're <laughs> oh, yeah, really plenty. good at that. <laughs> Gorge yourself to death, all right? Do it up, bacteria. Um, and once the scientists understood uh, the, the structure of this Petase, um, they were able to modify uh, the performance of it by adjusting a few residues on its surface. So there's obviously big challenges still ahead for turning this discovery into a real world application. Um, you know, they still need to develop a technique for producing the enzyme cheaply, affordably, and then um, to harness that power on an industrial scale and be able to distribute that out worldwide, right? Um, now, the recycling of, of polyesters um, follow kind of a downward quality spiral, right? They lose some of their properties each time it goes through the cycle. Uh, bottles become fleeces and then carpets, and then they end up in the landfill. Now, pet petase uh, reverses this process 
uh, by reducing the polyesters to their building blocks so they can be used again. Um, now, again, the enzyme is many years away from like widespread deployment um, and it will need to degrade the PET faster than, than even now. Um, Professor McGeehan of Portma Portsmouth University states, there is an urgent need to reduce the amount of plastic that ends up in landfill and the environment. And I think if we can adopt these technologies, we actually have a potential solution in the future to doing that. Um, and why is this important? Why are we so worried about breaking down these plastics? Well, this is important because we got news stories like 64 pounds of trash killed a sperm whale in Spain. Which is an actual article, actually. Article title. Um, the young sperm whale um, washed ashore in Spain and they most likely died because it was unable to digest the 60 pounds of plastic trash, fish netting and garbage bags that was found in its intestines and stomach. So in the end, the, basically the whale couldn't process or, or pass all that garbage would cause you know severe inflammation because it's like can you imagine eating plastic bottles like they, they wouldn't sit very well in your stomach you know oh yeah well it's like taking 60 pounds of food shoving it into your stomach and go good luck trying to digest that right um now the pet taste would be like mmm yum <laughs> oh yeah it's dinner it's a buffet at that point so great let's give it to it right and um the the most, the strangest thing that, uh, that this article has actually highlighted, at least to me, is that there are these garbage patches all around the world uh, in our seas and oceans. And the presence of these plastics is actually one of the greatest threats to the conservation of wildlife throughout the world. Um, Writer Matthew Hag states that pollution in the ocean has disastrous effects, particularly for wildlife. Because of the ocean's currents, some buoyant debris eventually settles in islands of trash. Now, let's just let, let that sink in for a second. Islands of trash that float above or just below the surface. And now there is one such area between California and Hawaii that's actually known as the Great Pacific Garbage patch and is now estimated to contain at least 87 87,000 tons of plastic that that was incredible to hear so when i when we will look more into it there's actually five of these gar garbage patches um all around the world and and based on the way that the ocean currents move this plastic around they tend to collect at different spaces the largest of them all is, uh, of course, in the Pacific. And the, with this kind of amount of plastic pollution that's being produced right now, scientists actually believe that it could have worse effects than climate change when it comes to, to affecting animals. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, maybe some of you are thinking, what's the big deal? No one's really in the ocean except some fish and some whales. Yeah, no. <laughs> We're creating islands of trash in our oceans. What? <laughs> well, and you know, one That's of the not right. one of the causes of extinction outside of global warming would be pollution. Pollution levels, you know, what they consume. Uh, there have been several pictures of all different kinds of animals, including even birds ingesting lighters and pieces of bottle caps and all this other trash that we just throw out because we're too lazy to walk two steps over the trash can to put it in and we just leave it on the ground because we're like, well, it doesn't hurt me any, but yet something eats it because it doesn't realize it's not food or it tries to take it home with it or something to put it in its nest or what have you. And what happens is they swallow it, they can't digest it and they die. And this over time can wipe out many species of animal. Now, we also did have a good question too about, well, what, what are the potential uh, detriments of using this new bacterium well, so far, there hasn't been any that's been uh, found in research, but they also need to research this more. This bacterium actually is a newer bacterium that they just recently kind of discovered. Um, there was a lot of mystery and still is around this bacterium as they, you know, again, just recently discovered it and went, wow, this actually breaks down PET. Amazing. So as for what are the long-term uh, impacts from this is a very good question, but thus far, we're not seeing anything uh, in the research that states what that could be. 
be, you know, if you look at it too, for instance, you know, there was this huge hype about everything had to be antibacterial. You know, oh, this lotion has to be antibacterial. This, um, san you know, we have to have hand, san hand sanitizer everywhere. You know, this has to be antibacterial. Oh, this is antibacterial soap. Uh, you know, this has, you know, whatever it is, it had antibacterial in it. But of course, we later learned that, wait a minute, it kills 99% of germs. Well, wait, don't. Isn't, isn't there germs that also help us survive and are good germs that will protect us from the bad germs? Yes. So now we're just making ourselves more susceptible to the bad germs because we killed off not only the bad germs, but the good germs. And so, you know, now they're starting to pull back on this whole hype of antibacterial this and that. And so, yeah, that was the long term impact is making people more susceptible to, to sickness which is actually the antithesis of their goal in the first place. And so, yeah, it's a very fair question to then go, hmm, what could be the long term? It's great it breaks down plastic, but what else does it break down? Or what other things um, could it do or create after sitting there because it doesn't have plastic to feed off of? What else does it interact with and how? And as this is much newer, I guess it looks like researchers haven't really found anything yet, but it doesn't mean there couldn't be, right? Um, and probably will take much more research. Uh, to let you know too, for instance, in this one study, researchers collected 250 environmental samples such as soil and sludge from the yard of a PET bottle recycling factory and analyzed many different species of bacteria that were growing within the samples. One bacterium which they named um, Idianella sacchinesis, or sacchinesis, which is the pet taste now that they are calling it, um, could nearly completely degrade a thin film of PET after six weeks at a temperature of about 30 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, also, the 201F6 strain of bacteria uses just two enzymes to eat PET and break it down. Uh, so you have, and basically it breaks it down into more environmentally friendly components as they say. Uh, the first enzyme uh, is called petase, breaks down PET into a compound called MHET. Uh, the second enzyme, which is called metase, or MHETase, uh, further breaks down MET. So we know that this is much more of a process than just breaking down the pettase. There's, there's a lot more steps in this cycle. And so it'll be interesting to see well, what other parts of this cycle happens in when this breaks down, what is, what is being left behind, and what are those residuals and what is their impact on other things within our environment if we were to spread this out into our environment, ideally to get rid of this plastic. And also to add another bit of knowledge from RX Mongo and Chad, tests were done with mealworms. They gave them a strict plastic styrofoam diet. Yum. Tasty. And the worms turn it into carbon dioxide. Okay, that's not great. Worm biomass and biodegradable waste. Which at least the biodegradable waste is biodegradable, right? But CO2 is a little like... Meh. Right. And Trunk says, antibacterials, don't get me started. We are looking down the barrel of a multi-resistant variety of cholera. Holy shit. That holy shit is mine. Uh, currently, one antibiotic still works against it. But hey, at least my fucking trash bag is coated in antibiotics to be antibacterial so it's not smelly. That's right. The USA. <laughs> Well, as long as it smells good, looks good, tastes good, it can't be bad for you, right? Right. I would like my trash to smell because then I know it's time to take it out. <laughs> sure, it's always a nice friendly reminder so you don't have the shit overflowing over to the floor. So. Yeah, I would like that. I just need resistant bags, like stretchy bags. That's all. That's all I'm good with. <laughs> Uh, and also real quick, not to uh, completely take off from this topic, but we would like to also thank and welcome Dalamaz officially as a subscriber to the podcast, to the stream. Thank you so very much. We really greatly support your uh, or appreciate your support. Again, you know, as we do this, we do this for you, the listeners, for you, the viewers, whether we're doing a game stream or our talk show. And we want to provide so much more. And so, you know, not only having you here listening or subscribing for free on iTunes or YouTube or what have you, but also um, actually paying a $4.99 subscription to us or, you know, sharing bits through Twitch or donations. 
that all is a huge support as well and again goes right back into the stream and into the podcast so that way we could keep upgrading equipment keep lights on bills on be able to do this more often for you all uh do more shows like this and be able to actually do more uh creative works but also more things like interviews like we would love to get some people in the sciences and arts and education or thing actually in the studio here talking with us uh but a lot of times it it does take uh, finances to be able to do that so of course any kind of support like that is also hugely appreciated so we just want to thank you Dalamaz and everyone else who's either here and chatting or lurking again every single one of you are absolutely amazing we really honestly can't say enough but we really really do appreciate it as once again I've said this before during a game stream we didn't think anyone was going to listen to us or watch us <laughs> you know we were just like you know we're passionate about this stuff we want to talk about it get a discussion going we never assumed that we'd even have uh, one person in the chat with us, but we'd be just talking to a wall, which is fine because we already did these conversations anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you know we're we we can't thank you enough. We're, we're you know we're just so incredibly humbled uh, by everyone who listens to us, who engages with us, and shows support. Um, so just thank you is, is what I want to get at too. Is that's huge news for us. So thank you very much. TLDR, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, so I think, you know, science doing good stuff, that's really exciting. I I was flabbergasted by by the this ocean stuff and and it just it floors me. Uh, I mean, I know that I only know 0.0001% of everything that one should know in the world and I'm I love these these podcasts um, and these conversations and all of the things that that you and Chad actually tell us because I I I, there's so much I don't know, and it's so wonderful to find out about these things. Uh, not wonderful in that, oh, I'm so glad they exist. <laughs> Some of the terrible things, yeah, yeah. We're not happy that, you know, no. certain negative things exist, but... Uh, but it's good to be aware of this stuff and, and see, you know, um, and it's hard, right? Like I was saying before, it's hard to try to, to change the entire world in one day by any means. Um, but um, it's definitely good to understand what's happening in the world. Um, see all the different places that you maybe want to try to make a change or try to help out. Uh, but again, just spreading awareness. You know, um, there's there's two ways of, of spreading the light, right? One is you can be the candle and one is you can be the mirror reflecting that light. Um, I believe Edith Warden maybe said that. Um, and so it's it's very important to just uh, to be aware of what's going on. Uh, and then if you do want to make a change, figure out ways that you can um, help with that. And uh, I'm just I'm glad that there are people looking out for our, our global world, um, like these scientists who are like, hey, maybe we should do something about all this plastic that's clogging up our <laughs> oh yeah well it's too late you know we're in la and so when we're driving up and down the freeways we see depending on the location some areas are actually incredibly clean and they do a great job other places are trashed right most of it is plastic uh it's bottles it's some sort of plastic wrapper of some sort or plastic bags that again those plastic bags can't really be recycled or cannot be recycled and are some of the worst things to have, which is why so many cities and states are trying to get rid of using plastic bags anywhere and trying to get people more toward using their own uh, reusable bags. Uh, you know, France and many other countries already do this. They already make it so that way they're not, no one's using plastic bags and that what they're doing is using the reusable bags. And it's just kind of the norm. Um, and some places are, st are trying to implement that now uh, in the U.S., which is fantastic. I know places like Cambridge, Massachusetts is doing that. I'm sure eventually Boston will down the line. Uh, we also have places like L.A. County, where everywhere in L.A. County, you pretty much go. Pasadena, I think pretty much the whole entire state, if I know, if I, if I'm getting in the sense right, uh, pretty much is all reusable bags. Otherwise, they charge you per each bag that you yeah, get from Yeah, I think it's a, a California law. I think like a state law, but... <laughs> We only recently moved here. We're still trying to figure out a lot of things about California. <laughs> yeah, and as Trunk says, in Germany, they've banned plastic bags in supermarkets, and there's a reason for it. There's a, you know, a severe reason for it, and that reason is because of the environmental issues uh, that it causes. It's, it's not to benefit the businesses in that sense, but again, you know, it also costs states and, and, and cities so much money to send people out there to try to get all that trash, to try to um you know 
handle all the trash that's out there on the side of the roads and in the parks because people don't want to use trash cans. They don't want to wait to get to a destination when they're driving. They would rather just throw it out their window and keep moving. I mean, that's expensive to try to get around to all those different parts, send people out there to try to pick up all that and handle it. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of budget. So, you know, one of the best ways is to try to nip it from the source. Indeed. Good conversation today. My mind is a buzzing. <laughs> Thank you again for everybody that has joined us um, on our live Twitch stream. We are live every Saturday at 1 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. So if you're listening to us on Podbean or iTunes or any of the other podcast aggregators or you're watching us on YouTube, uh, feel free to join us every Saturday, 1 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time uh, and talk to us about all the different um, crazy shit that's happening in our world, but also some of the good stuff that's happening in our world. And feel free to let us know that if you have any topics that you'd like us to discuss um, or learn more about, uh, feel free to contact us. Uh, on our website mindminepod.com there's a contact form right there um, also if you are part of our discord let us know in the uh, talk show channel we'd love to find out more new things last week um, was it last week or the week before well, I learned all about vertical farming and that was a very interesting uh, topic as well so uh, and that was suggested by one of our viewers so we really appreciate those comments and those requests so please let us know we want to talk about the things that you want to hear us talk about so uh, let us know on that Absolutely. And uh, just to let folks know who do watch us on Twitch, we will be doing another game stream today at 5 p.m. Uh, PDT. So right now for us, actually, it is 3.27 p.m. to give you a time reference here for those of you who are live with us and uh, maybe from another country somewhere in Europe. Uh, we just want to let you know that we will be on in just a, a short time here with more God of War, the, the most recent in this storyline from uh, Sony Santa Monica Studios. So so we'd love to have you come back and join us for that. Uh, we'll also be doing that tomorrow at 1 p.m. PDT as well. And of course, if you weren't able to catch us live, but you want to see what it's all about, uh, you can also view all of our videos on YouTube. Uh, we launch them actually every Tuesday around 5 p.m. PDT. So you make sure to subscribe there for free and be notified whenever they go live. And with that, we will see you all a little later on. Thanks so much, folks.